It's Red Eye Radio. Gary McNamara and Eric Harley talk about everything from politics to social issues and news of the day. Whether you're up late or you're just starting your day, welcome to the show from the Uniden America Studios. This is Red Eye Radio. Hello and welcome. He is Gary McNamara. I am Eric Harley. As we begin a Monday, Gary, how are you? Good. Had a great weekend. Did you? Very, very interesting weekend. Yeah. I mean, very interesting weekend. All right. Well, well, I won't say the entire weekend, but Friday was great. Okay. Friday. I think I told you that uh, I got an invitation from my local coffee shop, and I know the owners are they're just great people. Uh, and I've talked about my coffee shop before and actually put it on social media. Is this that coffee with a criminal thing? No. Oh. Okay. No, this is not coffee with a criminal. Okay. Because, uh, you know, things in society are changing. It used to be coffee with a well, cop. Now I'll, it's coffee with a well, criminal. I'll tell you this. Almost right across the street from my coffee shop is the barber shop, which is an old bank that they say Bonnie and Clyde robbed in Cedar Hill, Texas. Oh, wow. And that's what the scuttlebutt is. I didn't have not checked it, but I, I don't want to check it. Yeah, don't. Yeah, I don't leave, it, <laughs> leave it alone, because if you discover that it's not, it yeah. will be a letdown. So just let it lie. Right. Let yeah. the you know, just let it. The the legend should live on. So it's, so it's just a, it's a great coffee shop. And so I got an invitation. I think it was Thursday. Yeah. And it said, uh, uh, come on down. We're you know, we're uh, we're produ- we're the the last scene of a independent pilot TV series. Yeah. Uh, yeah. which is a five-part series, is being filmed there. Okay. And, and it's like, if you want to come by and check out and see what it is, it's like, okay, so yeah. Friday afternoon, I've got all these great plans. Oh. And so you know, uh, wake up, work out, call Dad. By that time, it's one thirty in the afternoon. All right. And I'm getting a little tired, and I have all these plans to do the lawn and everything else. And I end up going to sleep, waking up. I said, well, if I'm going to do this thing from 7 to 10, I might as well go to sleep. Yeah. Get some Z's. Yeah. So I wake up at about 5.30. It's like, oh, I'm just dead to the world. I'm like, uh, well, do I really want to go? I mean, yeah. eh, I go to the coffee shop. I mean, it's, it's, it's a great coffee shop, but, you know, have a cup of coffee at 7 o'clock, you know, watch these people do something. And that was about, you know, showered and everything else. And about quarter after 6, I'm like, oh, all right, well, here we go. wonder what this would be like. Hour later, I'm standing in line with a, with a, uh, with a speaking part. Okay. So I go from just going there to observe this thing to having a speaking part. Yeah. All right. Within an hour. Yeah. It's like, oh, okay. Now, my speaking part is simply saying my name to get in uh, to the coffee shop, the bouncer. It's the where the mob head, mod, mob head hangs out. And so... Was they, everybody else in the movie fully clothed? Yes. Okay. I, I did not. Okay. I, I don't know. All I right. don't know what it's going to be rated. I don't know. Yeah. I know it came off a short film uh. that Amazon Prime was playing, uh, I guess, uh, uh, in 2021. Right. Called a family thing. It's a local producer here, uh, Mark Rios, uh, you know, who's really well known. You know, the amazing thing is I love observing people doing things that I would never do. Yeah. And I just walked in there. I mean, they were just, you know, so abrasive, you know, abrasive, <laughs> embracing, <laughs> embracive. Okay. <laughs> Embracing towards me. And uh, it was just a, a great time watching it, you know, being made because there's so many, as we know, streaming networks today. Mm-hmm. And all of them need content constantly. Badly. And, and so this is the business. And it's amazing when you see you know, an independent filmmaker, you walk in and you think there's going to be these huge, you know, sound booms and everything else and massive cameras. Yeah. It's not that way anymore. Right. The cameras and everything they have Mm. are, you know, small. The microphones, because the first question I asked is, where where are the microphones? Mm -hmm. And they go, in the camera, shooting right at you. Yeah. And then I thought about it. I thought of a boom over people. You know, mm-hmm. I thought of a boom over people, but sound is going out and the boom is picking it up from on top. Okay. But when you think All about right. a directional mic that's right on a camera that's eight feet away from you, you're probably getting better sound with the modern, uh, you know, with all that today. So it was really, really great. I mean, I had I had such a great time and uh, want to thank. Uh, and I had I was in uh, two scenes. 
two scenes. So in a three-hour period, they did the last. It was the cliffhanger where the mob boss is assassinated. And and by the way, it's kind of, you know, they're this is stereotyping, frankly. They found out you were from New York, and then all of a sudden, oh, it's a mob movie. We got somebody from New York. We're going to give them a speaking part. Well, they thought I might have been, you know, had Myrish, uh, Myrish, Irish Bob, <laughs> Myrish. Well, that's that, what they uh, call him, the, the Myrish. The Myrish. I like yeah. that. <laughs> it's, it's the mob of the Irish. <laughs> wow. <laughs> is that a new Irish slur? The Myrish. Yeah. <laughs> and hey. I made it up. We're not magically delicious, but we can magically break your legs. You just, you just, uh, you combine mob with Irish, put yeah. the M at the beginning, the and you have Myrish. The Myrish. Uh, <laughs> you might have thought I was with the Irish mob, but yeah. I did tell him my story, though, which Im- impressed, uh, which impressed Mark. Right. And he, he told me later, he goes, I was impressed by that story. And that's when I was an 18 year old bill collector. At yeah. the the old Marine Midland Bank in downtown Buffalo, which was a subsidiary of HSBC even back then, right? The big yeah. HSBC bank, right? And uh, I was a bill collector, and uh, I co- collected a line of credit, which was unsecured revolving credit that you could that you could get. Yeah, and so the people that had those accounts were, you know, probably upper middle upper middle class to rich. Mm-hmm. That's the people that had those accounts, right? And so we'd had, you know, ball players, stuff like that, and they would come, you know, down delinquent. You'd have to give them a call. Mm-hmm. Well, all of a sudden one day I look and I'm like, oh, boy. And I see the name Peter Magadino. Mm. Peter Magadino was the, was the son of Stefano Magadino. If you remember the Appalachia Conference of the Mob, mm-hmm. it was, uh, you know, Stefano Magadino that actually got that going. And that's where the FBI got in. And that's where really the beginning of busting the mob began. Well, you know, Peter was allegedly also <laughs> in the mob, uh, and uh, I had to call him. His account was, you know, past due. Here I'm an 18-year-old, and when you grow up in western New York, you know exactly who they are. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's like, uh, hello, is uh, Mr. Magadino there? <laughs> Let me ask you, young Mr. McInera. It's McInera, right? Do you like simple things in life, you know, like walking, <laughs> using your legs? <laughs> And the friendliest individual, embarrassed, not angry at me at all, angry at his accountant. Because it probably, I'm going to guess, the 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 monthly payment was maybe 150 bucks, 200 bucks, which is mm. a lot, but not if you're mob rich. Yeah. It's nothing. And so here a bank is calling. It's like two collections, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Their type of collections, <laughs> not your type of collections. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, you're right. I never thought about that. My yeah. form of collection was probably a lot more milder. Yeah. Even though uh, any member of the squad uh, would accuse me of the uh, same loan charking collection methods because right. Right. there's a moral equivalency between a bank and the mob. Right. The squad, of right. Yeah, exactly. Yes. I like how I just yeah. went into that. We'll just fold that right in, uh, naturally. But I, I had to call him twice, and it was the second time where he really got mad at his accountant. And so I started looking in the newspaper to see if any accountant came up. Yeah. All any right. accountant body came up in a landfill. It did not. It yeah. did not. But he liked that story, though. Well, it's interesting because the uh, town where we have some land uh, is filming a Christmas movie because their downtown square right now is decorated for Christmas. Now, it won't be one that comes out this season. I'm guessing it won't be out until, I don't know, Christmas in July. <laughs> it probably will be, you know, I'm guessing next year. And they're filming and they were looking for extra people. I'm like, yeah, I'm not going to make that drive. It's like an hour and a half, maybe a little over an hour and a half away. I worked on a movie called Texasville, probably, in my opinion, uh, in the top ten list of worst movies ever made. It was the... Yeah. <laughs> it was the sequel to, um, what was it, uh, the, the picture show? What was the, I'm just, I'm blanking on. Rocky Horror Picture no, Show? No, 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 no. Uh, the Last Picture Show. The Last Picture Show? Yeah. Peter Bogdanovich. Okay. Uh, so I, I was originally brought in to be a young Jeff Bridges. A girl that worked with me was the 
young was going to play, did play the young female counter lead, uh, the, 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 the female lead. And I wasn't tall enough in proportion to her. Christine, ah, still to this day, is like six feet tall. I mean, she's very tall. Uh, and so they said, well, we don't think so, but maybe we can put boots on you, you know, because they were going to do some flashback scenes. And it was, uh, what's her name that was on Moonlighting with uh, Bruce Willis? And I'm blanking on her name. Uh, Sybil Shepard. Yeah, Sybil Shepard. Uh, yeah, so there was, they decided, okay, nonetheless, we need you, you know, since you work for a radio station, can you bring your radio station van and be in the parade? And my boss at the time actually was in the angry mob that went to the bank. <laughs> There's no money left. I'm telling you, there's no money. Uh, but um, there, you know, so the whole town was kind of involved and it was happening right outside my cousin's door. I mean, every morning they were shooting right outside her door. And so we, Annie Potts was in it. She was very funny on the set. Hilarious. Um, her hat fell on the ground and we were in a parade scene. She was riding a horse and she said, and the, the extra or whoever it was picked up the hat and gave it to her. She says, I'm not wearing a hat that just dropped in a parade route with horses. <laughs> and she was laughing about it. But it went it went for days and days and days. I made actually hundreds of dollars. I wasn't expecting to get, to get paid. You sign up for something like that. But the most interesting part of it was watching Peter Bogdanovich work. You know, watching yeah. the director. Yeah. Because that did have... You know, the huge movie cameras and mm-hmm. and the whole thing. I don't know what reason they used them. <laughs> well, I just Cause the movie wasn't yeah, great, but what what I what I was so, uh, you know, I'm I think about this when I was when I went up with the Thunderbirds and what impressed me most was not even the technology of the mm-hmm. airplane, but the professionalism of the people. Yeah. And so to see an independent, you know, basically TV series, you know, one of those kinds, I think they're it's. In, they're starting out, I think, with five for the first season. Mm-hmm. So it sounds like something like Reacher, you yeah. know how they do Reacher I, eight mm-hmm. they do eight episodes mm-hmm. on uh, on uh, on Amazon. But what got me was how small of a staff they had. Yeah, you yeah. know you you know yeah. you had the uh, uh, the executive producer, director, lead actor. Yeah, and you probably had about twenty actors that were there. Yeah, and and uh, just a couple of people to set up everything, and they did it quick. Mm-hmm. I mean, in three hours, they probably got the last five or six minutes because it's the last scene of of the the fifth episode cliffhanger to hold you into next year. Yeah. And right. that's the and the whole thing is they use that to, as I was explained to me, they use a cliffhanger to sell it for more than one year. Yeah, they often, in right. fact, many series end in a right. cliffhanger. And, and, and <laughs> It's funny story, This the show 24... Fox only ordered 13 episodes, but the yeah. sell was, well, we'd like to finish 24 because back then you would do 22 or in this case, 24 episodes a season. And nobody does that anymore. As you mentioned, now it's down to eight, maybe six. Uh, and so they do, you know, back then they were trying to sell them and say, Hey, well, we need at least the full year to get the full 24 out of the, out of the way, but it ended up being a hit. But uh, it was interesting watching it play out. Right. One little parade scene that was maybe 20 seconds on film took five days. Wow. Well, what impressed me the most was everybody had their lines memorized. Everybody, yeah. had, oh, It yeah. was amazing. Yeah. But everybody walked in, and it's like they probably said, okay, we're going to shoot at this little coffee shop. Everybody show up. This is what you're wearing. And they yeah. all came in yeah. you know, with what they were wearing, and they just sat there for three hours, drank some coffee, yep. you know, finished it, and... All right, take care. It's yep. like it was so incredibly professional is what really, you know, and well organized with very few people and I went sorry but this is where Hollywood's going if you're looking at, you know, AI and oh, everything yeah. else. And the assassination no. scene, you know, there's no gun sounds. Right. They add yeah. that in they all in, that in post. They add that yeah. all in later on and yeah. and the muzzle fire and yeah. all that. Yeah. But it was it was uh it because when the assassination place took there's, you know, 20 people, a lot of young kids because it was the mob boss, uh, you know, 
inviting all the neighborhood kids for his Christmas party because it's not about him, it's about them. And right, I always yeah. love that line because he yeah. kept repeating it, right. which the message is it's all about me and got nothing to do with right. you. Right, <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> which which was really cool. So I want to thank uh, the director, uh, producer, lead actor, Mark Rios, for being just, he was really, really uh, great and just uh, – I didn't feel like at any point, come on over, come on over, come on over, come on over. They wanted me to take my camera and, you know, like you do those uh, behind the scenes things with the actors. Yeah. Come on. You know, it was just great. And then finally says, okay, uh, you know, where, where are the people invited? Uh, uh, Gary over here. It's like, yeah. am I in this? And I had the camera going. I'm like, I was, this is my big shot. It's, it's wild. <laughs> Cause I was working on an industrial video one time for a, a large truck company. And the guy that was my counterpart on that video, we were, it was like we were uh, analyzing sports on a set, so we had our lines. But he told me during a break, he was the acting coach for one of the leads on CSI, the TV show CSI back in the day. And he said, this guy never flubs the line. He's got a square jaw. And he may not get an Oscar or an Emmy, but he will show up, hit the mark, deliver the line every time, and he gets work all day because of that. So the professionalism thing relates because you've got to get it done. And if you're wasting their time, they don't want to work with you. Unless you're Al Pacino or someone like that, they don't have any interest in working with anybody who can't do the job. It was a great time, though. 866-90-RED-EYE. This report is brought to you by Shell Rotella. With advanced synthetic technology, is designed to help keep your rig running with more mileage and less maintenance. Cold temperatures and water can lead to only one outcome, and ice has no place in a truck's air system. That's why it's crucial to keep your air system moisture-free as the temperatures begin to drop. One of the simplest and most cost-effective ways to keep moisture out of your air system is to change your air dryer desiccate cartridge. This should be changed as recommended by the manufacturer or annually as part of your preventive maintenance routine and preparation for winter. Make sure your air system is in top condition before plunging temperatures put it to the test. Lines open for your calls. 866-90-RED-EYE on Red Eye Radio. You've got to step out of the blue bubble. And it's not like social media. He can go back and forth on social media with Greg Abbott, with DeSantis. With... Call in and get a word in edgewise. Eric Harley and Gary McNamara. On Red Eye Radio. And he's Eric Carney and I'm Gary McNamara. All right, coming up here on the uh, show, the uh, Supreme Court, uh, looking at the uh, the tax code. We will get to uh, that. Some mm-hmm. Hunter Biden uh, stuff I'm reading here. House Oversight Republicans defend closed-door Hunter Biden deposition. You don't need to defend it. Simply say we're doing that. And uh, if he wants to speak in front of the public, we'll do that too. Yeah. As they said. Right. So right. I, mean, I don't... I don't right. see where they have to go after uh, uh, that. Will DeSantis get a little push after the debate with Newsom? Did you see that it was um, four and a half million mm-hmm. watched it? Yeah. I thought there would be a bigger. I thought maybe there might be a bigger audience for that. I mean, that's pretty huge for them, for Fox. You would think more of the left would jump on and it really yeah. you know for fox that's a bit a big showing but for something that is that big mm-hmm. not a big national showing You're listening to Red Eye Radio from the Uniden America Studios. And he is Eric Carley, and I'm Gary McNamara. Good morning. Download our Red Eye Radio app today and listen when and where you want. If you can't listen live overnight, I'm sorry, but I just saw this Wall Street Journal editorial. Can Washington still do anything? Ha! Well, yeah. They can spend. Well, they they, they can, spend like nobody's yeah, business. They they can do a ton of stuff. I mean, a ton of stuff they can do to um, mess up your life. Mm-hmm. You know, you had told me and and uh, last week, I had I had seen it that it was out there. The uh, new Jim Brewer, the comedian, yeah, uh, and his uh, 
his new special, which is free on YouTube. Yeah, Country Boy Can Survive. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I will, I, I, the, as I'm watching it, because if you look at him, what, what Brewer is known for as a stand-up comedian, for example, is his impersonation of the lead singer of ACDC. Yeah, Brian Johnson. that and Goat Boy. Yeah, And Goat Boy, yeah, exactly. Mm, Goat from Boy. SNL. Yeah. And so I've seen him before, and mm-hmm. it was interesting. And I did see his last special where he hit the COVID stuff a little bit. But I'm telling you, the wall is coming down. And I think Brewer may be the 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 one, not that you had Dave Chappelle come out, and especially on the radical transgender movement, he hit it. Mm-hmm. Brewer went across the board. He hit everything. Yeah, yeah. You know, he was hitting climate change. Uh, you know, he was, he just was, uh, he was hitting the, the whole, uh, uh, you know, Joe Biden thing, basically yeah. saying that the United States with Joe Biden up there every day, were a sitcom for the rest of the world. It was really effective. It was really effective stuff. As you told me, you, you said, Gary, you got to see it because the audience is Jersey. Yeah, this is, he went back to, cause he lives in Florida now and he talks about that, but he went back to Jersey to do his stand-up special this one and that's where he you know that's where he grew up he grew up up in the northeast and and he talks about a number of things but the audience was very responsive oh. in a positive way they were cheering him on much of this most of this special is sounds like a rally and it's interesting at the end, when 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 he when he closes, you know, uh, a lot of comedians, m- most great comedians, will tell you, you know, they'll they'll look to the audience. Thank you, uh, Nate Bargatze. I think says that every time. You know, the fact that you showed up means a lot to me. That you know, and they're very mm-hmm. grateful about it. But he, but Brewer, you know, Brewer has his his routine, right? His yeah, shtick or right. spiel, whatever you want right. to call it, and it's a lot. Of, it's very loud. Um, he does the whole <laughs> dinosaur thing of, you know, kind of screaming into the microphone and, and that kind of thing. <laughs> and it's, that's kind of how he gets the point across. But at the end, stone cold, serious, you know, thank you for being here tonight. Get out there and build your neighborhoods back. Basically sending that message, you know, don't let the radicals take control. And it was very interesting, the tone in the last three seconds, because it would be too easy to dismiss Jim Brewer as a guy who hasn't thought it out, right? Yeah. Who just is Sto- going through a routine. Stoner. He's, yeah, and he's just kind of, and he's done, you know, he's had some specials and in, in stand-up that, kind of centered around that whole stoner thing, you know, throughout the years. This one was very different. This was Carlin like. It it really was it was it was Carlin's approach Jim Brewer Jim Brewer's delivery. And yes. that's the, you know, that's what you hear. You hear these very serious points and I thought cuz he talked about moving to Florida, and I didn't realize, and I this is the first, I was watching it. I was watching the timer. The first 16 minutes of it are just straight on going after the radicals. It is, yep. And, and I thought to myself, is he going to, is there going to be any pushback from the audience? I didn't know whether or not he was... You know, at that point, if he was in Florida or Jersey or anywhere else, I didn't, you know, didn't know. Um, and it, it just kept going and the audience kept responding and, and mostly a, a positive, you know, they were laughing, but they were also kind of cheering on some points that he was making. And that didn't stop. That kept going. Yeah. And he was talking about, you know, the reason he gets the, uh, uh, the, where he got the title for the special, uh, you know, meeting some folks from the South and they were teaching him how to hunt because he was trying to convince his wife. He goes, he goes, I've never owned a gun. He goes, but I, I feel comfortable, more comfortable living in a place where I'm surrounded by people who own guns. Yep. 
And, and he got a cheer. Yeah. People like, were cheering whoa. that on. And then it was about, you know, uh, he says, you know, the there's a, the, a uh, uh, Hank Jr. song, Country Boy Can't Survive. He goes, I listened to that song and it broke it down. And it's like, wait a minute. Hold on a second. There's something here. What would happen, you know, if the world went to hell and I needed to basically, and I'm paraphrasing, but and I, I needed to provide for my family. And it's kind of growing up in the South. It's actually how you grow up thinking. What do you have the skill level to do if you need to feed your family, if you need to house your family? What can you do without anyone else's help? What can you do with the tools you have and your own two hands? And, you know, that that becomes a very real question. And, 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 I and think the Boy Scouts, ponder, where I grew up, the Boy Scouts used to teach that. Yeah, right. And now they teach other things. <laughs> and so, you know, but it was a it was part of the you know, it was just part of the culture growing up in the South. It, it, it always has been. And, you know, it's it, I mean, there are school districts where they close the first day of hunting season. They, they mm-hmm. shut down the school district. Um, but those are things that, you know, you and, and I think it's part of our own instinct. I just don't know that. Uh, you know, and it could be. I, I have a friend that grew up in Arizona, and they they kind of did the same thing. Uh, and that's the Southwest, but not exactly the South. But it's it's this instinct of all right, who do I rely on? Who who do I rely on? And do I walk around thinking? You and I talked about it recently yeah, the last we week yep. about the you know the whole prepper mentality. Um, my pantry is full, and I can feed my family for at least ten days on just what's in my pantry, probably a lot longer, um, but easily 10 days if, you know, the grid went down or, or something happened like that. Um, we've talked about over the years, uh, you know, the gold standard. Well, if all goes to hell, then, you know, well, actually, no, it wouldn't be the gold standard. It would be the water standard because that's what people would need, right? Water and food, uh, uh, Book of Eli. And so, you know, you look, at, at that and the mentality that he folded into it when you step away because again it would be easy to dismiss oh that's the kind of the shtick and the loud thing of it was so much more than that it was a statement and it was a statement and and you you mentioned it earlier in our pre-show meeting and and it is different than Dave Chappelle Dave Chappelle you know is I mean <laughs> Some of the burns that he threw down were just, whoa. And I think it had a lot of people reconsidering, but it was mostly on the one issue, on the transgender thing. Brewer shredded the left, and I mean shredded the radicals on so many things. And he wasn't, and he even said it, look, I'm sure you're a lovely person if you, you know, been supporting this kind of thing, you know, I'm, you know, mm-hmm. I, I love you guys, but and then he shredded the idea. That's something, and I thought to myself, "My gosh, he's doing a rally." Well, the I, I think that what you saw, and the reason I say in stand-up comedy, he broke down, he 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 broke through the wall, is because of the loudness of it, his facial expressions, which indicated. These policies and the things the left are doing are insane. But he also came across as somebody who really, except for his previous stand-up stuff where he did a little bit on COVID, yeah, he has been viewed as you know not a not a comedian who is you know challenging what's going on, and he's uh, you know and he's coming across as somebody who is driven by his comedy is driven by the stupid policy of what we're getting from government. Now, it's a it's a perfect time if you're going to hit government as a stand-up comedy mm-hmm. to hit it, and I think he picked the right time, but he was completely unapologetic. That was the thing that got me. Yeah. There was yeah. no, yeah. well, look, I understand this. It was like, boom, yeah. you people are nuts. Yeah. And yeah. it's yeah. stuff that we have said exactly. on the air in a different way because we're technically not stand-up comedians. <laughs> But it's the the kind of bluntness that you want out there, and it's a kind of bluntness that you might have got. You know, you look back into you know you you, you look back into the uh, more of the activist comedians in the '60s and the and the, and the '70s, 
yeah. and uh, yeah. but that were very funny. But Brewer isn't known for that. Carlin wasn't initially known for that. So right. when you viewed yeah. Carlin, you viewed him. Okay, this is a guy who's not doing it as an activist to promote something. He's just viewing the insanity of what's going on. Mm-hmm. That's what I got from Brewer. Yeah, you know, for example, you know, the the Daily Caller is doing that new movie on the transgenders in sports. You've seen that, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It was it. I forgot the name of it. It's a uh, something ballers. You know, yeah. girl, girl, whatever. Right. Yeah, and yeah. you can sit there and it's like, well, you know, if you if you subscribe to what they do and I'm like, OK, that's a movie that you're attempting to show to the converted. Yeah, it doesn't. Right. You know, and that's right. the first thought that I had. Mm-hmm. I wasn't impressed by the, the trailer. I mean, yeah. it, it just it didn't it didn't grab me. I, is there stuff that could be funny in a movie like that? Yes. Is the movie funny? I don't know. I probably won't see it because I don't subscribe to the uh, the 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 daily the daily caller, but you would look at that and say, "All right." And Ben Shapiro talked about that they wanted to do stuff like that. Yeah, right. Yeah, you know the right. the um, and um, you know that that was their their was it the Daily Caller, Daily Wire, Daily Wire, Daily yeah. Wire. I'm sorry, yeah. Daily Wire. Yeah, Daily Wire doing it. Thank you. And and he talked about doing it, but that comes across that we're activists for, the, and it's okay to be an activist for the right mm-hmm. because I I agree with. The principles, but it's not coming from we're just a movie theater doing this. It's like we're on this side and we're doing it with Brewer coming out. I didn't know what side Brewer was on five years ago. No, in fact, I've heard him in conversations and interviews where I was led to believe he was clearly on the left. Yeah. And this was anything but, but it was so loud and brash and confident and promoting the insanity of the left and where they stand on the issues, that's, to me, I looked at it, I go, wow, that may be the... Other comedians are going to look at that and go, he can do it. Look at the response well, he's getting. He, we may not be able to go to colleges, but yeah. we can go out there and we can promote this insanity. Because if you forget about right or left and yeah. just the issue alone, I mean, it is comic. Right. What's, it, it's maybe dark comedy, but it's comic what's going on right now. Well, and, you know, he talked about the difference between, uh, well, the, the, basically the two-tier justice system. He said, you know, China's watching this, you know, this whole thing go down, and they're looking at us going, wait a minute. The president's son gets caught with cocaine, gets caught with a hooker, gets caught with a gun, and they arrest the other guy? Yeah. <laughs> I mean... It was a it was a rally. Yeah. I really wonder how many people that got tickets to that knew that it was going to go that way, but were still cheering it on that they weren't the converted. They didn't know Jim Brewer was going to go down that road because they were cheering that on. They were, I didn't hear and, any booing. And, and it was almost like the sitcom laugh where you could hear the huge male and female laughs oh, at yeah. the end going. Oh. <laughs> yeah. No, it was it as if was, it wasn't politics or anything controversial. Yeah, it was just hilarious. It was it was a very positive response. Eight six six ninety red eye. We'll be right back with more red eye radio with Eric Harley and Gary McNamara. It's Red Eye Radio. He is Eric Carley, and uh, I'm Gary McNamara. Interesting, the Supreme Court uh, will um, look at the uh, the tax code and will debate the meaning of income. Well, oh, this is going to be fun. This could go very well or very wrong. <laughs> you know, it will be interesting to you know to watch. Uh, where it goes down, you and I have talked about it over the years. You know, when uh, they the basis for the decision on gay marriage really became about the equal treatment instead of equal protection. Right. And we've been saying, well, if it's equal treatment, then everybody seems uh, pays the same dollar amount, not percentage, dollar amount right. in if, taxes. If you're going to change the 14th Amendment. Yep. From equal protection under the law to equal treatment, yep. well, then that has to go across the board. Right. 
nobody gets anything different. Right. Nobody should get any more deductions right. than anybody else. Right. Everybody should be judged exactly the same way. Yep. Now, will they go down that road? I hope so, but I don't think they will. I don't think will. they will here. Top of the Hour News is brought to you by House Products. Visit HouseProducts.com. This is Red Eye Radio on Westwood One. Now, it's Red Eye Radio. Gary McNamara and Eric Harley talk about everything from politics to social issues and news of the day. Whether you're up late or you're just starting your day, welcome to the show from the Uniden America Studios. This is Red Eye Radio. All across America and around the world, we are Red Eye Radio. He is Eric Carley, and I'm Gary McNamara. Good morning. Oh, hello. Here we are, all right, well into December. All right. With very mild temperatures here. I don't see any cold temperatures in the forecast actually no no uh, it's uh it's crazy yeah uh man i'm i'm telling you it's i was out in shorts and a t-shirt in the yard on saturday and i should be later on today yeah it will be what do we got uh coming up 70 75 yeah thursday and friday yeah it's crazy i mean i'm not complaining but typically, we get to our first freeze by now. Typically, we'll get to a first freeze and at the very least a couple of frosts. We've had one that I that I know of. Mm-hmm. I don't think we've had more than two. And we've had one freeze that I know of. But I know when we get a decent freeze because I have one of my trees and all the leaves come off pretty much within a few days after that first freeze. And man, it's it's beautiful. It's really great. Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, I'm on a golf, but I've had knee problems. Well the thing is is that I would like to get all of my lawn work out of the way, you know, because oh I, yeah, that too. You get a couple of months off, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh I don't know if that's gonna happen. I don't know if that's you know, because my leaves on my tree are just coming down a, a few at a time. It's if you looked at my lawn, especially my back lawn, it's no different. It's as green as it was in the spring. Wow, not mine. And the front lawn got some of the frost, but my back lawn is uh, is protected by trees and an eight foot fence, so the frost doesn't settle on that grass. Uh, like it does in the front. So I've got a few spots in the front. But I'll, you know, look, if we're going to be in the 60s and 70s this winter, I'll take it. So will I. Yeah. After the last few winters. No, I'd yeah, like I'm not nice, complaining at all. Nice warm winter. They I would keep like. saying this El Nino pattern shows wetter and cooler than average for us. But they also did say, that that probably won't be until after Christmas sometime that that pattern will really start to affect us in that way. Uh, yeah, I don't like wet, cool winters. No, no. At all. I, I like I like it just the way that it is now. Yeah, I could never live in the Northwest mm-hmm. where they, you know, Portland, Seattle, where they get so much rain all the time. And I couldn't, yeah, can't do that. Yeah, I, I was there three years. And and uh, and dealt with it. I'll tell you this though: you learned to golf in the rain, or you didn't golf. Yeah, that's the one thing about living in Or. Can't tell you how many times I played when it was drizzling out, right. or even raining. Right. It's like you had everything. It's, it's like yeah. yeah. I had I had yeah. the rain gloves. Right. Right. You know, right, right. so you can you know hold on to the. It's like golf fishing shaft. in the mountains where where I go to. You got to learn. You know, bring a rain jacket because you're going to have those mountain showers, kind of like on the coast. Mm-hmm. Where you have those showers that come through and then they're just gone. Yeah, you got to learn to do it in the rain. We had so much last week that we never got a chance to talk about the Trump trial. Yeah. Jonathan right. Turley, though, covering it and a couple of really interesting things. He goes, the charges uh, brought by New York State Attorney General uh, Letitia James were curious from the start. No, they were bogus. Mm-hmm. Uh, James had run for office on the pledge that she would hunt down Trump 
a promise that apparently thrilled many New Yorkers. However, she brought a civil case based on Trump over and underestimating the values of his properties. As some has previously stated, there do appear to have been as some assets that were inflated or deflated in value. That may be common practice in New York real estate, but it's not a good practice. I believe, this is Jonathan Turley, a penalty is warranted for such practices, but those should be uniformly imposed and would be a fraction of the fortune sought by James in this particular case. The evidence shows that banks made money on these loans, which were paid off either early or on time. In fact, not one bank complained about the Trump's organization's estimations, which were accompanied by a warning that the bank should not rely on those estimates. Moreover, James is seeking to kill a corporation once viewed as iconic in New York, not just by denying the certificates for the Trumps to do business in the city, but by imposing $250 million in penalties for money that no one lost. Hmm. Uh, what's all become more curious this week is when two bankers were called by the defense. Uh, you had Rosemary Verblick and Dave Williams, who worked on Deutsche Bank loans to the Trumps for years, and they testified that the banks made millions and viewed Trump as a much sought after whale client, uh, the, which is uh, describing a very high net worth individual. Williams testified that net worth is subjective, which is uh, in such documents as property valuations and are offered as mere estimates. It's not uncommon for bank estimates to differ from a client's. Verblick wrote emails at the time about the benefits to the bank in dealing with the Trumps as well as pitches to the family and that the bank was happy to extend conditions which allowed added benefits of flexibility, rate, and service to get that business relationship. Uh, Judge Egeron seemed irritated by the testimony, however, and when the Trump counsel asked why the bank was so eager to secure future loans, uh, Engeron snapped back, they're trying to make money. Why wouldn't they be interested? I'm telling you, this is ripe for it, appeal. It, it's, I mean, it's almost as if they're throwing this to appeal. I, it's, it's bizarre the way this judge is behaving. Right. The real question here is James overriding interest in killing the company. The judge has already declared that Trump is guilty of fraud. I looked at that as immediate signs for appeal before any witnesses you know, were there in front of him. Mm -hmm. I look at that and go, who the hell does that? Right. And he is weighing the massive penalty sought by James and eagerly supported by many New Yorkers. The eagerness could prove the court's undoing, however... Some of the judge's earlier orders are currently under review, yet it is James' demand for the effective dissolution of the corporation and $250 million in penalties that could push this case beyond the curious to the unconstitutional. It is relatively rare for civil damages to trigger constitutional review, and it is still far from clear that this case will rise to that level. The New York law is unique in allowing massive penalties without loss of a single dollar by a bank. However, James wants dissolution and crippling damages. That could trigger a high court review. In 96, the Supreme Court decided a case, BMW of North America versus Gore, striking down a punitive damages award. The case involved the practice of the company to repair and repaint uh, cars damaged in transit without telling the customers. The jury in the original trial awarded 4000 in compensatory damages for the lost value to the car in not having a factory paint job and other damage. It then imposed $4 million in punitive damages for the company's dishonesty, even though the Alabama Supreme Court previously reduced the punitive award by half. The U.S. Supreme Court still found that the award violated the due process clause as grossly excessive. And you could make the case that you were damaged because you did not get the original paint job on it. Yeah. And you should have at least been told that they were damaged in transit, whatever that small damage might be. You should be informed of that. There is no damage here. 
Right. Nobody's complained. Right. That this was the people that had those cars that complained. Yep. Yeah, this there has been no one that's been able to prove any damage in these cases. Right. And even the charges themselves the charges say in an effort to essentially manipulate or get favor from insurance companies and banks. There's no indication that any favor was given other than the fact that Donald Trump was Donald Trump. Because here's the thing, the one thing that we haven't even brought into it, and that is a Donald Trump type whale, as they del- uh, as they describe him here, a huge whale, a billionaire that is doing business with a bank, any bank, is good news because word gets out that's where he does his business. If anything, if you were going to be so radical in the way that the attorney general of the state of New York is radical, wouldn't you be looking at the banks were trying to find favor from doing business with Donald Trump? That's where the benefit is. Insurance companies, banks, they all do their own assessment. Right. They're required to do their due diligence by the shareholders and investors and anyone with an account in that bank, quite frankly. If they don't do that, if Donald Trump came in and said, well, I own Mar-a-Lago, Mar-a-Lago and 10 properties next to Mar-a-Lago, but he only owned Mar-a-Lago. All right. Well, now that's fraud. We already have we have a very clear law breaking. But the assessment on Mar-a-Lago coming back from the judge. Oh no, eighteen million. Eighteen million. Mm, he got blasted for that from the real estate industry. And this is right. and and you saw the frustration here with him as these witnesses for the defense are testifying. He's getting frustrated because he's being proven wrong. Because the testimony of the bankers highlights how out of proportion this effort has become. Mm -hmm. One would expect that banks uh, would have sought action, legal action, as the aggrieved parties if they had suffered losses as a result of Trump misconduct. They would have done that then. They did not. While they discontinued working with the Trumps after the start of the New York uh, criminal and civil actions, they have remained silent until, uh, you know, they have remained silent until these bankers testified from right. Deutsche Bank. Mm-hmm. It's just amazing. It's just absolutely amazing. And just, I guess the thing is, when you look at it, and I think it was Wall Street, was no, it was National Review had it, it's the indictment, stupid, why Trump is leading. People look at this and go, we, we can't, can't let a two-tier system justice, justice, justice system stand. Right. 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 That something has to be done about that. And the people, if you're a, you know, if you're a, what back in the day we would call you a one issue voter. And if that's your issue and that's what you want defeated, there's nothing wrong with supporting Donald Trump because of that one issue. Well, it's a very important issue that we have talked about and we get it. We understand. Look, there is right now, we've laid out all the radical views of the left. All the radical views, everything that the left has broken. And if you don't believe us, ask Jim Brewer. (laughs) And as that is laid out in front of you, then you have to ask yourself, because everything we've said, it's, it's all a choice. Politically, we decide this. And people have to decide where they stand. And it's no longer about, you know, well, I'll never vote this, I'll never vote that. You have to decide what you actually, what kind of society you want to live in. 866-90-RED-EYE. Brought to you by FPPF, Fuel Power Max. Uncompensated detention at docks frustrates drivers of all stripes. If you're an owner-operator, you have at least some control over the matter. Make the subject a standard part of your rate and or contract negotiations on the front end. You can use your own numbers to calculate an hourly rate to compensate for lost income opportunity, as well as fixed costs, which don't stop when the truck stops. 
Those two elements of a fair detention rate were deemed appropriate by most of Overdrive's audience almost a decade ago. We've used income, fixed costs, and miles average of our owner-operator business services from ATBS's clients to compute an average $64 an hour detention rate then. And 10 years later, the figure is $83 an hour. Use your own numbers to calculate your rate. A simple conversation with any broker or shipper or your carrier, if you're leased, about what you're putting in the rate might yield results you don't expect. Odor Operator Business 101 is provided by Overdrive's Partners in Business Program. Go to OverdriveOnline.com to the Partners in Business section of the website for more details on this and many other topics. Brought to you by Shell Rotella. With advanced synthetic technology is designed to help keep your rig running with more mileage and less maintenance. Coming up, more with Gary McNamara and Eric Harley. It's Red Eye Radio. It's Red Eye Radio. He's Eric Harley, and I'm Gary McNamara. I hope uh, this goes to the federal courts uh, afterwards. If uh, you know, because the again, the the judge said before they even started the trial that he has found Trump guilty, and yeah. and again, partly based on the the Mar Lago uh, evaluation that he said was eighteen million. That real estate people said, "What are you out of your mind?" And we started talking about the fact, and it seems like it is now clear because. The prosecution didn't deny it that Trump put a disclaimer on all these estimates. Yep. And as the banker said when questioned that got the judge mad, these are all estimates. Right. These aren't, you know, it, it, these are all estimates of people put in. It's like, okay, fine. Uh, okay, let's do our own appraiser of it. Which brings me to this question in New York. Then if you are fighting your property tax. Mm-hmm. And you give an estimation of what your house is worth. Number one, you may take, be taking a, a a guess. I used comps when I did mine and and found it to be way lower and, and fought it and lost. It was two to one. One person agreed with me. And I would have been better just to say, okay, uh, somewhere in between, if I did it, just took it down ten or twenty thousand, I might have gotten that. But nobody was playing legitimately what the value of my property was worth because nobody bought it. But are you telling me now that in New York, that you could face fraud for what you, when you're fighting with your local property tax assessor, if you're protesting and you put in what you believe it's worth? Can the government come back and say you're committing fraud? Well, think about if this if this law if this passed or if the precedent was set here for Trump. Think about your history of income. When you go to a bank and you want a loan, a home loan, any kind of loan, you show you you show them the history of your income. You can't prove the future of your income. Right. Well, the history implies that you're going to be making the same money or maybe more even down the road that you are going to be able to pay back this loan. Well, the fact of the matter is that's based on what? Pure trust from the bank. And they may ask you to have a down payment, but a down payment still isn't the brunt of what you're going to owe on that house. So they're going out on a limb and they're trusting. They're making an assessment. It's an estimate right. for the future. When you look at this with the property, uh, any kind of property that you own, two different banks may do a, a write-up on that property, and their valuation may be very different. Two different banks may say, well, we only believe it's worth this. Well, we believe it's worth that. And that happens all the time. Well, is that the bank skewing the numbers? Well, they're allowed to skew the numbers when they're, doling out the money insurance companies well we believe the risk is this other insurance companies say well we believe that we're as an insurance company able to take a greater risk with this type of client or this type of well, property but but couldn't they if james go after the banks for what they estimate too that's what i was that's can't, exactly can't go, what i was saying can't you go both ways on it exactly what well 
they benefit from having a whale as a client. Yeah. So why not go after them for manipulating it, you know, basically because they have Donald Trump as a client? Gary McNamara and Eric Harley taking your calls. 1 866 Red Eye. And he is Eric Harley, and I'm Gary McNamara. Download our Red Eye Radio app today. Listen when and where you choose, if you can't listen live overnight, to one of our great radio stations. Uh, all right. Where are we going here? What do we got? I don't know. What do we have? What, what, what do we have? There's some. Oh, I was just thinking of something. Oh, oh yes. The. Uh, uh, the uh, fallout from the debate last week, mm. 4.5 p- million people watched it uh, on Fox, which means uh, roughly 330 million people did not. Uh, but it uh, got some publicity, especially on on uh, on social media and not very much celebration at all from the left. You and I thought that it might be attractive to a lot of Democrats to actually watch that. Apparently, that didn't happen. Right. Yeah. Most Republicans know uh, where DeSantis stands. Uh, Newsom is brand new to uh, to people, but there didn't seem to be any type of, uh, I, I think, uh, super curiosity over how he would do on the left. Well, uh, that apparently, you know, didn't happen. Um, but also, I think. It's true that many rank and file Democrats already know about the problems of San Francisco, California. We don't believe you're stupid. The left believes you're stupid. But people are aware of the problems of California on the left. And Ron DeSantis was not necessary in order to deliver those over and over again. In the debate, he crushed it. But it's a debate that's already happened. How do you know he did a good job? How do you know he crushed it? Trump did not criticize him. (laughs) Trump said, now, I mean, this is the best you're going to do. You're not, as as the headliner, going to say DeSantis crushed it and destroyed Newsom. The best Trump could do was... They both did a really good job. I, I thought it was about even. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it wasn't even. No. Mr. Trump. No. It wasn't close. It was an old-fashioned butt-kicking by DeSantis over Newsom, which, by the way, none of it ideologically is far at all from where Trump has stood in the past. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and, you know, the realization of, uh, what's going on in California versus what's going on in states like Florida has already happened. It's happened by many on the left that have left California. You know, when you see that play out, the debate has already happened. Them being on stage the other night was kind of after the fact. You know, it helped DeSantis make his points, but he was repeating points He was repeating the reality that is already here and has been here for a while. So people moving out of California, corporations making decisions to leave California. When you have pharmacy retailers that said, we can't do it anymore. You have so much of a vacancy, you know, and and, and real estate, uh, commercial real estate right now, in California and to some degree in New York, but other major blue areas that are right now losing population, then a debate like that is just kind of a recap more so than, hey, this is. And back in the day, it used to be because politically you could still say in the abstract, well, if this continues, then California will see companies and individuals leave California. And then every, everybody on the left said, ah, that'll never happen. But you're just basically repeating on that stage what has already happened. 
It helps politically. It helps DeSantis. It doesn't help DeSantis for 2024. It probably helps him for the long term, whether, you know, he runs for governor again, runs for another office, or eventually runs for president. I believe he will run for president at some point. I just don't believe he's going to be the nominee in 24. And if the numbers don't change in the state of Florida, the primary numbers don't change, he'll want to get out sooner than later. You don't wait until a week from March 5th to drop out. As a sitting governor of that state, you want to get out long ahead and acknowledge what the numbers are and say, you know, we gave it a shot. We certainly made some noise. And this isn't over. We will be back one day to fight another fight. And and that's where it goes. But unless it's health reasons or Donald Trump standing up and saying, eh, I've decided not to run, Donald Trump will be the nominee. So that's, you know, there's, I, I, I guess it's not much of a shock that you didn't have a huge audience. Uh I think one of the problems, too, I'm wondering about, we've seen it with sport, uh, all the sports channels. Mark Cuban brought it up in the acquisition of the Mavs that the TV money is changing. The TV money is changing because people don't subscribe to cable. And in order to tune in that night, you had to have a cable or satellite TV yeah, you're right. account. Yeah, you're right. Great and point. I... You know, that's if you were going to stream it, what I would love to know is how many people followed up with and you pretty much have to go out and and find the the video or the audio cuts. Uh, They were all over social media. And there's no doubt it had an impact there. How many people were curious to look for that? I don't know. But the fact of the matter is, is that if you're requiring them to subscribe to cable, or satellite TV, you're going to have a limited audience. No, you you make a great point. I'm somebody who cut the cord two years ago. Now I get most of the stuff online anyway. I mm-hmm. wouldn't be, I don't wait for my news. I go get it. And so, you know, over the weekend, I was able to watch a number of sites, the actual debate, um, you know, that had, you know, from Fox News. Right. Uh, but um, most people don't do that. If it's on, fine. But I think it's been two years since I've cut the cord. I don't even miss it. There are so many, there are so many streaming channels and all the news I can get. Yep. I can get all the hearings, you know, from C-SPAN, Forbes on, on, uh, on, on YouTube, Fox on YouTube. There's so many different, uh, especially Forbes. Forbes goes through and actually goes through and has so much of the hearings that have taken place. Mm -hmm on uh on uh on youtube they put a lot of raw stuff on if there's something yeah, going they on do. in capitol hill yep they put raw yep. video up you know 10 15 12 minutes whatever yep. throughout the day of something yep. if they it's do. going on and and so uh you you look at it overall and you just say okay uh how are you ever going to get a massive audience anymore which means right. you have to put it on a number of uh of of stations or well, in fact, of networks. You just pointed out a lot of these networks actually are realizing the monetization thing on, on uh, social media, but on YouTube and they're putting stuff up after the fact. I know ABC news puts stuff up. Uh, Good morning, America. Uh, they do all of that stuff. They, they put everything up on YouTube. It's not just the monetization though. The, it, the reason behind the monetization is because you're trying to reach the audience that isn't there with you on TV. Now, that's a broadcast channel, that's a network, and that's different. And I did wonder, you know, would Fox see this? They're not going to see a non-presidential debate as worthy of the network. That's not going to happen. But I wondered about the, you know, the debates going forward. If, If it's so fragmented, it is with 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 sports, we know that. It is also with news. We have a very low trust in the American media, so people don't want to really pay for that. And even in the free media and the network TV media, they don't want to tune in because they don't trust the media. So 
I think it's, you know, there's there's a couple of things here, uh, you know, to take away from this. And that is, I think that ultimately the left and right and what's going on with the left, the rank and file Democrat already knows. They already see it. Mm-hmm. They're making their choice as to where to live, you know, um, and 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 where to move to uh, what's going on with companies is nobody is shouting, you know, CVS, you know, the, the radicals on the ground there in San Francisco, of course. But nobody else is shouting CVS is wrong for closing their stores and, you know, Walmart and all these stores that are closing in certain areas. They understand exactly why it's happening. So you don't you're not having to convince people in the way that you would in the abstract. But you would think uh, you would just think that uh, and and maybe people have figured out Newsom already. Maybe they have. Yeah. Uh, again, he hasn't been around long enough, but I thought there would be more curiosity uh, in in Newsom by Democrats and even independents, unless people have got it figured out. If you're looking at Florida versus California, well, duh. Mm-hmm. And yeah. and so there was just, you know, re- that that has been such a debate. That's been a debate now since the COVID lockdowns. Yep. And so I thought there might be more curiosity from the left looking at Biden and saying, man, <laughs> Sort of like uh, they say about uh, on uh, Office Space, what's his name? The one guy, eh, he's useless. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. But I, you, that you would have more Democrats who believe that, who absolutely believe that. That's why the majority of Democrats, landslide numbers, don't want Biden to, to, to run. Mm-hmm. You would think there would be more curiosity over who the media was basically saying was the heir apparent. Yeah, and, sure. And it didn't. Didn't seem to be a lot of buzz. Only saw a few articles on it from the radical left, you know, saying, oh, th- that uh, <laughs> Newsom just cleaned up with this. Absolutely destroyed DeSantis. I burst out laughing when I saw that. And, of course, it was on abortion. Yeah. Right. And I'm just like, no, that didn't happen. Yeah. It right. didn't. You didn't watch the right. same debate that that uh, that I watch almost uniformly. It was Wow. And you didn't see a lot, hear a lot about Newsom over the weekend either. No, you didn't. You know, I, I, you mentioned something, you know, this debate's been going on since COVID. And I wonder how many rank and file Democrats in the state of California, these are the people that were directly affected by his policies when he was telling them, you have to do this and he was doing otherwise. I like a number of Democrats. And you kind of feel that burn. You feel that hypocrisy. And I don't think the whole slick approach works anymore. It never worked with me. But a lot of voters bought into the imagery. You got to have more than that when you come to the table now. What you got out of this was uh, a, a template that that DeSantis gave all Republicans for 2024 mm-hmm. how to argue with the left, mm-hmm. including, I hope, Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. And the reason I say that is Trump, who was eviscerating DeSantis before the debate, had nothing bad to say. Right. You know, now he wasn't going to say he, you know, slam dunked over Newsom, even though he did. What he said was, I thought they both did really good. Uh, I call it uh, roughly. uh, Yeah, he went neutral. Yeah, he he went for him to go neutral on it means he, he sat there and went, wow. Yeah, when's the last time he didn't have a strong opinion about something? DeSantis. You know, <laughs> or anything. Exactly. I mean, just issue just a scathing, right. whether you agreed or disagreed, and you know, some kind of scathing review one way or the other, and it didn't happen. So Republicans have the template right there. Yeah. How do you argue? How do you win in 2024? Look at that. Yep. 866-90-RED-EYE. Get in touch with Red Eye Radio, toll free at 866-90-RED-EYE.
It's Red Eye Radio. He is Eric Harley, and uh, I'm Gary McNamara. Coming up following uh, the top of the hour, we will get to some of the polling uh, numbers uh, that are uh, out there. Also coming up here, I, I don't think I have anything on electric cars for the first time in about a month. <laughs> uh, I was I was watching uh, some, there was a, a video put out by Marques Brownlee, who is a tech reviewer, and he reviewed the Tesla Cybertruck. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that came out of his review is that the numbers on the delivery in terms of the cost for the truck were not what they promised. And that Tesla's missing the mark on deliveries. And this is something we knew. I got to be honest, I don't like the look of the truck. In yeah, fact, it's the I. number one critical point that people make on the cyber truck um it doesn't matter if it's bulletproof if i won't drive it and the fact of the matter is is that if you promise that well this is going to be the cost on delivery and it's not that's point number one nothing else matters because you just shifted the price point therefore the market for that vehicle going forward This is Red Eye Radio on Westwood One. Now, it's Red Eye Radio. Gary McNamara and Eric Harley talk about everything from politics to social issues and news of the day. Whether you're up late or you're just starting your day, welcome to the show from the Uniden America Studios. This is is Red Eye Radio. All across America and around the planet, we are Red Eye Radio. He is Eric Carley, and I'm Gary McNamara. Just reading here. Yeah. uh, Chuck Todd was doing Meet the Press yesterday. Is he filling in? I don't know, but uh, went to media, and he goes, there's something real here. Some Mm. level of UFO knowledge is being covered up by the government. Mm Mm-hmm. Journalist and congressman tell Chuck Todd. And you get nothing out of it. I mean, it's nothing that, that I, that it's nothing that I've seen in a media report that I haven't seen since the 1960s. Hmm. And Operation, what was it? Operation Blue Book at that time? Hmm. Looking for you. It's the exact same. Somebody needs just keep at, scream that question to Biden over and over and over again. And somebody say, are you a coward? Why won't you? Because then you call him a coward, then he'll, I have to answer this, right? Of course. Why are you a coward and not telling everybody? Because Republicans are getting quite antsy about this whole uh, UFO, well, UFO knowledge. We first have to clarify the terminology. UFO is unidentified flying objects. Mm Mm-hmm. So does the government have knowledge of what these unidentified flying objects could be? And if so, why not go through some media outlet should go to Biden, Trump, Bush, yeah, Clinton, and Obama and ask them specifically, are there extraterrestrials? Right? Yeah. Why isn't anybody doing that? And then, and then you have the story afterwards that if there is something, and when you do that, somebody comes forward it and says, nope, we never told them, just like an Independence Day. We didn't tell the president. We didn't tell any presidents, you know, going back, you know, all the way to, uh, all the way to Clinton. Mm-hmm. That over the last 30 years, Every president over the last 30 years, everybody has been kept in the dark. You yeah. want that story. Push this story forward. I'm getting sick and tired because I'm sitting here thinking to myself, oh, so the UFO thing all came up in the midst of the uh, Biden corruption. Mm-hmm. So you're like, okay, 
Are we learning anything new here? Well, no. Everybody's still saying the same thing. Yeah. And even the information that came out that was supposed to be slam dunk, remember the congressional hearings? Mm -hmm. Everything was hearsay. Right. You're like, okay, if if this has risen another, another DEFCOM level, why has it? And nobody's answering that question. What changed? Well, this report came out from people that said they heard from people. That's meaningless to me. Go to the source. Right. And then try to convince me that if there are extraterrestrials out there and we believe they there are that the the presidents over the last 30 years were not told about it somebody has to ask them specifically get them all together in the room i you know i i was certain that when trump got elected we were going to learn everything on day one. Oh, you guys wouldn't <laughs> believe how many ufos there are <laughs> They, we have them. There's alien life forms right now walking around every day. All right. Get your sunglasses. If, if Exactly. If he gets reelected, I'm almost certain of it. <laughs> okay. Fine. I'm going to tell everybody everything. Um, I, I do wonder. Uh, Jim Brewer brought it up. You know, it's. As, like, a de- as a deflection. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's 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 a deflection. But you got the people in, where were they, Arizona? Or was oh. it Nevada? No, it was Vegas. It was, yeah, outside of Vegas. And, the, you know, hey, there's something that crashed in our yard from the sky. And there's some kind of creature. It's like 10 feet tall. It may be 12 feet. There's two of them, actually. 10 feet, 12 feet tall. I I don't know if we've reached a point where we're just calling BS on everything or we just accept that as a society and go, yeah, 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 uh, aliens from outer space. We have other things to deal with. We have inflation. <laughs> yeah. When I see one, I'll let you know about it. Otherwise, I don't care about somebody else's story. Where it's either... It's either or. And the stories have been out there and more numerous. We get people from the military. Oh, no, I definitely saw it. Oh, here, look, here's a video. Here's a video when I was actually in official capacity in the U.S. military. Here's the video of it. And we're like, yeah. We really just kind of shrugged it off. And. The people who had been looking for it all along went, aha! But you know what? They've been going, aha! For somewhere around 70, 80 years. Yeah, exactly. Post-World War II yeah. is when it really started. So it really didn't change much. Yeah. And I don't know that it will, barring, you know, they. Could, I'm convinced they could land... Step up to a podium and say, hey, we're here. We've been here for a long time. We're just hanging out. We just need to refuel, and then we'll be on our way, whatever. And people would go, eh, okay, yeah. But can you help us with inflation? If not, get off the stage. Well, yes, here's our book. Yeah. And our book is to serve man. Yeah, exactly. So It's a cookbook. It's a cookbook. And, you know, I just, I, I just think that we're still in that mode of yeah blurry videos aren't going to cut it i can get 4k video on my phone and you guys are still serving up these blurry videos of i don't know what yeah and why didn't anybody take a picture of those right. two aliens in vegas exactly they were 12 feet right or 10 or you eight know, are, are they looking to get some uh hits on their social media account uh, as content providers? I don't know. Did they actually see something? I can't tell you. And look, I don't know what the answer is. Who does? But when you keep telling me and bringing it forward and rehashing old stories year after year after year, I want something new. And as we've stated, 
Well, forget about getting something new. Go right to the source. Go to all the ex presidents. Mm -hmm. They have to know. Right. Ask them the question. Right. If they all say, sorry, we can't answer that top secret information, we've moved forward a little bit. Yeah. If they say, no, we saw no evidence and we were never told, well, then that means that they don't suspect that there are extraterrestrials out there or they've been hiding it as they did an Independence Day from the president. And that guy, he was a fighter pilot. Right. Exactly. Well, but, you know, and it's inevitably it's and then two men in suits showed up at my door. And, you know, I'm thinking, you know, to myself, well, maybe that's because you called the government. <laughs> Call 911. <laughs> and then all of a sudden these government people showed up. Yeah, do you know who you called? That's my evidence. Exactly. 911. There's extraterrestrials outside my door. Right. 24 hours later, Mulder and Scully show up. Well, that's expected. Exactly. You know, I mean, the story really hasn't changed much at all. No, it hasn't. It's been this way since the beginning. And what do you have? Well, I saw something. There's something there. The government. Well, we don't. We don't have anything. The meme I liked over the weekend was Santa Claus looking down, and there's Bigfoot carrying a Christmas tree, and and Bigfoot looks up and go, "Oh, you're real!" And Santa at the same time, "Oh, you're real." <laughs> yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. You know, I mean, it's we're just I think in that state of. Distraction? Actual, actual disbelief. Oh, okay. You know, where it's, it's well, I mean, so many, if you think about the, the bizarre things that are actually happening, why isn't there more outrage? Ah, close the door. Draw the blinds. <laughs> Don't answer the phone. You know, that's that's where we are. And on things like this, it's, well... Until they step up and say, and it's a sitting president that says it, no one's going to pay attention. It'll be the same people who are always paying attention saying, aha, look, to everyone else that's not paying attention until that happens. And I think that's where we are. I just don't think it's you're going to convince anybody. You know, I mean, I don't know how many comedians have pointed out, I know in one of his stand-up specials, uh, Nate Bargatze did, look, we pretty much had proof there's aliens. COVID, nobody cares, nobody cares. Sorry, we're dealing with COVID, we're dealing with everything else. But that is, and Jim Brewer kind of makes the point, in in that there are, you know, look, there's the other you know side of it. Could it be government distractions? Yeah. Well, distractions from all the stuff that they're doing. You know, it's easy to find out what they're actually doing. They're talking about it. They're proudly promoting it. You know, those are the things that, that kind of stand out to me. Um, is the fact, it, it is surprising. How many people aren't curious? They're just not curious. They just don't live in that world, well, choose not you, to live in that world. Or you, you throw out, you know, the, as especially with UFOs, you throw out the hypothesis in a shocking way, framing it that the government's hiding it and the extraterrestrials are there, and then you just drop it and nobody seems to care to the point of the curiosity of saying, where's your evidence? Right. And right. when you break down the evidence as the whole thing before Congress where, sorry, but I thought Republicans were too interested in that topic when there are many major other things. Who was it? I think DeSantis warned Republicans 
on the whole uh, a Biden thing. Mm. Yeah, do it. But you guys got to be talking about all the other issues. Exactly what we have said. Mm-hmm. You've got to be talking about the issues that are affecting Americans every day, which is inflation. What are you going to do about it? You need to go after Joe. And there does not seem to me, it seems like the last. Well, I mean, we did have Thanksgiving last week, but to me, it seems like Mike Johnson has gone into hiding as one of the quiet kind of speakers. Yeah. Sorry, you got to be promoting everything right now. Right. So. And, you know, and and I think that's. That's really it. Uh, You got to stay focused because, frankly. Until something happens on the Hunter Biden front, and I mean where, all right, we're officially moving forward on this, or if it got, you know, so bad where the president decided to step down or something like that, many people just won't pay attention. On the Russian hoax, many people, millions of people, still believe that the Russians helped put Trump in office. And it's been proven false. And they just don't know it. They just, I don't know, listen to a late night comedian, tell a joke about it. And they don't research it. Now, that one is very involved. But doing favors, getting political favors in exchange or and access in exchange for money, that's a very basic principle to understand. I still think far too many aren't paying attention to it. 866-90-RED-EYE. We'll be right back with more Red Eye Radio with Eric Harley and Gary McNamara. It's Red Eye Radio. Uh, he is Eric Carley, and I'm Gary McNamara. Uh, the uh, Supreme Court uh, case on uh, the tax code that uh, we'll get to coming up following the bottom of the hour. Really, really interesting because uh, this may be where the Supreme Court defines what income is. And it's all because of the Republicans' tax bill. Yeah, this goes back to the uh, Republicans' uh, mm-hmm. tax bill of 2017. And how it affected one couple. Yep. And it sounds like a small amount on what they owed in taxes based on that 2017 uh, tax law going into effect in 2018 uh, when they had to pay out this this amount. But they paid it and then issued a challenge, a constitutional challenge Mm -hmm. on um, taxing unrealized income from outside the country. Yeah, and that's interesting, and and also, could it be a narrow ruling based on just the 2017 tax law, or would it be a broader ruling, and how far would it go, if so, depending on, you know, what SCOTUS sees here, but they're going to hear the case, and... It will be interesting to see where it goes. I I love it. We'll get to the article here in a little bit. And the article talks about how, well, nobody's defined what income is. Right. Well, is income not income? Because when they talk about unrealized income, well, it's not income. Right. Income has to be realized. If you don't have it, if you don't have it at that moment, if you cash it in, you've got it. You haven't cashed it in, you don't have it. Right. Right. Yeah, it's, because you can't you can't use you can't use that that income because you haven't cashed that income in yet right. and received the profits on the capital gains. Right. And so I would look at it and say, well, I would say income is income. Mm-hmm. That once once you have the availability, once it's liquid then you have the availability to do something with it. Until it's liquid, you don't. So how's it income? Yeah, the moment because, it becomes income, you can tax it. Right, when you take possession of it. Right. Um, even if you turned around this couple, this money that they had in this, this investment, uh, this company, this foreign company in India, was going automatically back into it, but they never received it. They never 
did not receive a dividend and then have that dividend automatically go back. They didn't realize any money at all. The company has made a profit every year, but that money as the basically those who started this company saw to it, that was the intent to reinvest it so that company could grow. So the question would be then, all right, if you never take possession, because it would be different, um, they only had a 13% stake in this company. So they didn't have authority to compel the other investors in this company to give them a dividend. Had they received a dividend and then reinvested that dividend amount, then the, you know, receiving that dividend would mean they had possession of that money and then reinvested it. That would be taxable. That would be constitutional in my opinion. And and if, and if you, somebody hires you and says, okay, we're going to pay you a million dollars plus we're going to give you a million shares of stock. That million shares of stock that they give you does be is income at that point, right? The day that you receive it's a form it. of payment, right. right? And so it'll be interesting to see. We'll talk more about this case in a moment. America Studios. It's Red Eye Radio. He is Eric Harley, and uh, I'm Gary McNamara. Good morning. Uh, Supreme Court uh, has a, a, a case uh, coming up. As the Wall Street Journal says, a case that could punch holes in the federal tax co- uh, code heads to the Supreme Court tomorrow. The court will hear arguments in Moore versus United States, which challenges a piece of the 2017 tax law that imposed a one-time levy on profits that companies had accumulated outside the United States. But its implications could reach much further, providing the justices an opportunity to define what Congress can tax under the Constitution and what it cannot. The case is Eric brought up earlier, was brought by a Washington state couple seeking a $14,729 refund, and it raises the simple question, must income be realized or received before it can be taxed? Hmm. Charles and Kathleen Moore argue that when the law passed, they had not realized income from their investment in an Indian-based company, thus they couldn't be taxed. Uh, Some conservative groups have backed them, seeking a chance to block future Congresses from taxing wealth or unrealized capital gains. The broad ruling, a broad ruling for the Moors could create a constitutional bar against some popular Democratic proposals to tax the super rich. Tax lawyers and the government say, A sweeping ruling could also upend many longstanding rules affecting partnerships, multinational companies, and bond investors. Uh, Former House Speaker Paul Ryan, a Wisconsin Republican who helped write the 2017 tax law, warned in September that the case could damage a third of the tax code if the Moores win investors and companies could demand billions of dollars in refunds tied to the 2017 law. And a loss for the government could prompt a wave of lawsuits over other tax provisions, according to lawyers. It's hard to see how this is going to turn out well, said David Rosenblum, a tax lawyer uh, at uh, Kaplan and Drysdale. They really are opening up a can of worms. The Moore case stems from a piece of law from the 2017 tax law written by Republicans and signed by Trump. The provision itself was relatively uncontroversial. Before then, U.S. companies paid foreign taxes on foreign profits but could defer any U.S. taxes 
until they brought the earnings back home. Republicans switched to a system with a minimum annual U.S. tax on foreign profits and tax-free repatriation. In that transition to deal with 30 years of profits, companies had accumulated overseas that hadn't faced U.S. taxation, Congress imposed a one-time levy. (laughs) This is interesting here. Mm. Um, The bulk of the estimated $333 billion in revenue that change generated is being paid by large companies such as Apple, Apple, Alphabet, and Microsoft, but the tax also applied to some individuals, including those who owned more than 10% of a foreign corporation. The group includes the Moors who had invested in, uh, is it Kizencraft of Friends Company in India, the couple backed by the Competitive Enterprise Institute and other conservative groups, sued for a refund. They said they had not realized any of that company's profits, so the one-time tax was not within Congress's 16th Amendment power to tax income. Lower courts disagree, saying income does not have to be received to be taxed. The pair appealed to the Supreme Court, which will decide what the Constitution says about taxing income. The Constitution is ratified, gave Congress broad national taxing power, but it required that any direct taxes, such as per capita taxes, be apportioned among the states by population. After the Civil War, Congress sought to impose individual income tax, but the Supreme Court ruled in 1895 that such a move was an unconstitutional direct uh, tax. The response was the 16th Amendment, which says income from whatever source derived can be taxed without apportionment. That led to the modern federal income tax. The 1913 Amendment does not specify what income means, nor does it say income must be realized. But the question is, income means you have it. Well, if they didn't repatriate this money, the the Moors, this money didn't come back and benefit them some way first, land in an account, then they sit around with other investors and say, okay, let's put it in the company or let's all go shopping, whatever. If it didn't land to them in some type of dividend, I don't see how it can be taxed. Because then what you're saying is, all right, what it opens the door for is, all right, you invest, uh, okay, a thousand bucks in Apple stock. And it's sitting there and you're not cashing that out. But all of a sudden, over your lifetime, it gets up to, let's just say, in the next 20 years, it gets up to $50,000 in stock. But you haven't cashed that out. And tomorrow, it could go to zero. Right. That's the nature of an investment, including an investment in a company like the company they were or are a part of. Because it's not, they did not have the, the, the authority as 13% stakeholders in this company in India to compel the company to pay them a dividend. And that would be different. The founders of the company had intended this money is all going to go back into the growth of the company. It's all reinvested. So as 13% stakeholders, there may be a value you can assign to it today but tomorrow it could be zero. And you the get, company could go right. bankrupt and they get nothing. If they had taken that money into possession and then made a decision, we're going to put it back into the company, that's different. That's income that right. they realized and then invested in however they wanted to invest it. I mean, in order to be income, doesn't it have to be realized? To say that income can be realized and unrealized, right? Is that a false narrative? Right. Well, because are you then coming you can up get, with new definitions for income? Well, and you, if you watch the way the liberal media is covering this, the very liberal media, they're 
they're talking about this being a problem because they're what they're concerned about is the wealth tax. In other words, a Elizabeth Warren type tax going after people like Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk and anybody else on the left that they have where the majority, overwhelming majority of their wealth is in the shares that they hold before they've cashed out those shares. You know, the Amazon stock, it's not likely, but the Amazon stock could go to zero. There is that possibility. And if you own, I think Bezos owns, he's still the the, uh, top shareholder, even after his divorce, 8 or 9%. He recently sold this massive amount, millions of shares. And you look at, okay, he sold that. That's taxable. That's now he's converted that to cash. Because if we're if we're going to do this, this is exactly what the left wants. Well, as they accumulate that wealth, we can tax it more and more and more. Well, are you going to give them a refund if it goes the other direction? Yeah, I was the answer is no. You know the the uh, Fortune magazine had an article on uh, Bezos and uh, what he will save by moving to Florida on the estate tax. Yeah. Because Washington has an estate tax mm-hmm. that goes mm-hmm. from 10 to 20 percent over, right. I think, a couple of a million dollars or whatever. Right. He would save like 62 billion. Right. By moving to Florida. Well, which which planning for his family, if it's going to go to his heirs, is huge. Right. About, you know, where where you're going to go at that point. Also, they have a capital gains tax in Washington state of of the state capital gains tax of mm-hmm. like 7%. Right. They didn't go into the numbers there, but that also would be a huge amount because it's zero right. in in right. Florida. Right. So you want to park, which is one of the, you know, they talk about Miami becoming the financial center of the United States, mm-hmm. that it will eventually leave New York and it will go to Miami because my, just because of the low, because number one, you've got so many rich people now that want to invest their money uh, or move to Texas or Florida in order, order not to pay that kind of money. But they talk about, again, the gateway to Latin America is is Miami. Yeah. Right. And they view that as probably the possibility of being the financial center between now and, you know, 2100, mm-hmm. 75 years from now. Mm-hmm. All really interesting. But you look and, and but we've talked about capital moving from one state to another and the rich moving from one state to another. And the problem that's going to be for these blue states that have such a progressive tax code that the top 1% is at some points paying 50% of their taxes. And if you have a couple of hundred thousand and a couple of hundred thousand say we're going to move, mm-hmm. you've lost a significant portion of your tax base, but your bonds are still there that have to be paid off. Yeah. Your Medicaid, your Medicare, which is way over in a uh, blue state, what it is in a red state. Right. And then where do you get it from? You can't be borrowing money. So you got to get it from, you can't go into debt. You can't have a deficit. Right. So it's got to be in bonds or something somehow. So how do you do it? You've got to tax the middle class a hell of a lot more. Sure. And, you know, it's it will be interesting to see where the, where the uh, Supreme Court goes on this. Um, and what that will mean, because all those in on the left that are covering this, they're worried about the wealth tax, which hasn't kicked in yet. There hasn't, you know, the, one of the takes on it was, uh, this may underscore or, uh, 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 compromise the wealth tax that isn't, isn't even in existence yet. The left is hoping that Elizabeth Warren's plan can one day be realized. Well, if you can tax something that hasn't been realized, if you can tax income that hasn't been realized, well, then you start going after, again, gross profits for companies. Those companies that have to take the money you give them, that their consumers give them, and they have to go and they have to reinvest. McDonald's has to buy more hamburger patties and hamburger buns and those weird little onions. They're not taking that money home. They're putting that money back into it. 
while the left wants to greatly increase what we can tax them on when it comes to gross profits. So this would be a doorway to that, I think. A greater doorway or greater basis for that. It could give Congress a whole lot of power depending on where this goes. Or it could be that extraterrestrials are real and Congress and, wishes to tax them. And they're going to take everything from you and you won't have anything to be taxed. <laughs> They've come for our resources. That's right. Exactly. (laughs) Well, they haven't met the IRS. That's our only hope. (laughs) Maybe that's why they're putting 80,000 more agents together. Maybe it's not us. Maybe it's the aliens. They're freedom fighters from the aliens. That's right. Or against the aliens. That's right. 866-90-RED-EYE. Get in touch with Red Eye Radio. Toll free at 866-90-RED-EYE. It's Friday Radio. He is Eric Carley, and uh, I'm Gary McNamara. Uh, good morning. Yeah, I would agree with you because you and I just having the discussion. If the that the Supreme Court may just come back and say, "All right, look, if you uh, if you don't if you don't repatriate it, well, then you don't get the money." Right. Federal government. But if you repatriate it, yeah, just you know, this is the number that it should be at that particular point. But they may not define income. Yeah, I think it could very well be a very narrow ruling. You know, it has the potential to be to uh, upend the tax code (laughs) Mm -hmm. Uh, in a number of ways here. But I think ultimately they'll probably I think there's a good chance they'll decide on a narrow ruling based on whether or not they realize as investors in this company um, those that money. And if it if it was repatriated at any point. If it was paid in dividends, that would be different. And if it wasn't, then okay. Because the idea behind the 2017 tax law was, all right, we'll do this. And by the way, Tim Cook at Apple spoke highly of this. Um, As someone who's not a Trump supporter, to be clear, they wanted to repatriate some money, you know, but they were being charged under the old law because liberals wanted it that way, uh, way too much in, in income tax. And this allowed them to do that. This is Red Eye Radio on what? Now, it's Red Eye Radio. Gary McNamara and Eric Harley talk about everything from politics to social issues and news of the day. Whether you're up late or you're just starting your day, welcome to the show from the Uniden America Studios. This is Red Eye Radio. All across America and around the world, we are Red Eye Radio. He is Eric Harley and I'm Gary McNamara. Good morning. Welcome. Here we Here we go. Starting another week. In uh, in December, just uh, looking at some of the uh, articles that were written, not many from the, a uh, from a Democrat side supporting uh, Newsom. I saw one; I think it was the Daily Beast, hmm. and it was just a, an insane liberal. Yeah, you know, saying how <clears throat> Newsom absolutely dominated. It wasn't even close. DeSantis should have never shown up. <laughs> it's like wow. But well, you, you didn't see a lot of discussion. It was gone from the mainstream media by the time we got to Friday. Yeah. Um, and, you know, frankly, liberals really can't tell you how they feel because they didn't have Axios tell them why it matters. Yeah. Reading here uh, uh, from uh, from Joe uh, Concha, this is an article in the, me- in mes- the uh, Messenger, said DeSantis versus Newsom raised the profile of debates, but lowered the presidential prospects of one governor, mm-hmm. and that would be uh, uh, Newsom. Mm-hmm. And talks about how Trump has, uh, you know, skipped the Republican debates uh, uh, so far. He didn't have a second debate because of COVID uh, against uh, uh, Biden. And he said, so it was utterly refreshing the past week to see a nationally televised debate 
between the governors of the Golden and the Sunshine states, mm. the two most contrasting U.S. states, and two politicians who couldn't be more polar opposites. Yeah. Uh, said for some political junkies and good government advocates, there might be the hope that this matchup will prompt uh, more such debates. No, it won't. Giving voters a signal opportunity to evaluate candidates for the rest of America, it perhaps came down to deciding whether you prefer a nation that more closely resembles California and Florida. That's, to me, what the debate was about. Plus, I think afterwards, and it's uh, interesting that uh, Joe Concha says the same thing that uh, we do here. This is basically... Hey, whoever the Republican nominee is, and we even went further, members of Congress, any congressional candidates, any senatorial candidates for the GOP, he gave you the template to win. Yeah. A debate. Right. And to win on the issues big time. And uh, he goes, the big hike going into this rare non-presidential debate hosted by Fox and moderated from Sean Hannity was substantial with the focus mainly on one question. Would Gavin Newsom demonstrate that he could be a true alternative to President Joe Biden, the candidate even a majority of Democrats seem not to want as their 2024 nominee? We got our answer. After a performance that can only be compared to the Michael Spinks, Mike Tyson fight 35 years ago, Hmm. hosted, by the way, by Donald Trump in Atlantic City, it was basically over before it began this was the governor not ready for prime time and we're not talking about ron DeSantis. newsom's ego and his belief that those watching at home more than 4.75 million according to nielsen ratings were so misinformed as to believe his misrepresentations was truly something to behold For example, Newsom declared that it's a factual lie that the state of California has a higher tax rate. Yet, according to the nonprofit Tax Foundation, state and local tax collections per capita shows California collections $9,175 per capita in 2021, the most recent year available for that data, $4,405 per capita in Florida. California's uh, uh, gas tax 7.25%, 7.25%, Florida 6. California's corporate tax income rate, 8.84%, Florida's 55 California's state income tax is 13.3% at the max, while Florida is zero. Overall, Florida is the 11th lowest uh, tax burden in the U.S. California has the fifth highest. Newsom declared that DeSantis was the lockdown governor. You closed down your beaches, your bars, your restaurants. In fact, you had quarantines. You had checkpoints all over the state of Florida. Well, that is a blatant attempt to distort the truth. Florida was one of the first states to reopen, which immediately resulted in more than one major news organization accusing DeSantis of putting public health at risk. Remember that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. He was demonized. And restaurants in Florida never close completely. Clearly, DeSantis, based on widespread media coverage at the time, was not the lockdown governor that Newsom said he was. Newsom, however, locked down more than any other governor with mask mandates not being dropped until 2022. And Newsom infamously broke his own masking rule at least twice at the ritzy French Laundry Restaurant, and at the 2022 Super Bowl near Los Angeles. And they talk about the the fact that, uh, you know, they went uh, through all the issues, the poop map. Newsom continually trolled DeSantis for badly trailing Trump in the polls. But as Joe Concha writes, but polling numbers and policy performance are two very different things. On the latter, Newsom's record was exposed for what it was. And so was the vast contrast between Democratic and Republican policies that should be the campaign roadmap for whoever becomes the 2024 GOP nominee. First, that's the first thing I thought of on on, uh, Thursday night, Friday morning, which is why I said it, conscious saying it here. I just say not just the 2024 GOP nominee. Every member of Congress, whether you're an incumbent or you're running for the first time, 
you're a challenger. Mm-hmm. You should be using what DeSantis did. Sure. You know how we, I, how we know it was good? Trump didn't criticize DeSantis. Yeah, that was that was one tell. Um, and you also looked at it, and there was really no widespread liberal cheering of Newsom. It, which, as the ghost candidate, <laughs> phantom candidate. And you mean on shadow so, candidate and you, and you mean on social media or just in general editorials and things like that? Yeah, yeah just right. in general. Right. Because there was no crowd. The, there. there there just wasn't any kind of defending of him. Right. And so. What does it tell you? The left right now, the rank and file, they know what's going on. They know why people are concerned about it. And they also know why they can't blame people for being concerned about the spike in high crime. Think about this. Inflation. It affects every liberal. High crime in major blue cities. In fact, you could argue rank and file affects more liberals than it does conservatives Mm -hmm. directly in their everyday lives. These are things you can't deny which is why i think you didn't see the widespread turnout by liberals because they knew it was going to be a trouncing they knew it, what it would come down to they're thinking to themselves you know what i may have to follow bezos to florida they're the ones that look at this and say yeah this can't be sustained is it going to get them to vote republican I can't tell you that. You would think. But at the very least, they don't want to tune in for a trouncing they know is going to happen. They know what DeSantis or anyone who had any level of critical thinking was going to do and point at California and all the problems California has. You know, this is one thing the Democrats they they haven't been able to solve, but yet they still keep winning elections. Is that they see everything. The rank and file sees everything that their own party is at fault for. Yet they don't change their vote. So far, they haven't changed the way they vote. So you don't really have in this in that equation a big you know, jumping out in defense of Governor Newsom from the rank and file Democrat. Because there's really no way to do that. And they know it. They're living in the high crime area. They're yep. living with inflation every day. They're living with a broken border. They know it. I did see a story yesterday saying that the uh, Trump campaign is putting on signals that it wants to debate with Biden. Mm. And they've already been in contact, uh, certain media outlets with the uh, Biden administration that will not comment at all on whether there will be a debate or not mm-hmm. against Trump. Mm-hmm. And Trump's putting the word out there. I want a debate. Well, think about that. The debates would be several months. You know, we're talking Past the conventions, Mm -hmm. and if you're somebody speaking for Biden, and right now you can't say whether or not he's going to be good in front of the camera today, let alone months and months from now. Now, we've given Trump the advice for if he debates Biden. Turn over your time to your opponent. Mr. Trump, what do you think about this? You know something? It's well known what I think about this. I'm going to turn all my time... Joe Biden can have his time and my time to ad lib. Yeah. Joe, go ahead. You can criticize me. Because there's the thing (laughs) is that you can't bring notes to the podium. Biden has to ad lib. And it's the last thing his party wants him to do on a debate stage against Donald Trump. Is Donald Trump masterful at debating he can be 
Well, it depends on the he, day. He has the potential <laughs> to be. It depends on the day. Look, you can say what you, you will about him and uh, and Hillary in 2016. He won the election. And so with Biden, the the less Trump says, the better. Hey, we just want to get back to the economy we started and leave it at that. It doesn't matter what, whoever it's going to be. I don't know. You know, of course, uh, with the uh, party leadership or the uh, RNC leadership, who knows? It could be Chuck Todd hosting the debates, given the, the RNC leadership right now. I'm sure she wouldn't mind that a bit. Uh, Joy Reid, Whoopi Goldberg, and Chuck Whoopi. Todd. <laughs> All three of the debates. And, and Joy Behar. And Joy Behar. <laughs> Got to throw her in. Joy Behar will decide who wins. The debate yes, yes, each exactly. Time. <laughs> so, you know, as we have said on the debate stage, you're going to, and, and this is our problem with the leadership at RNC not just current leadership, but in the past as well. You're going to have to be better at putting your foot down, and they just, you know, she's all but rolling over. But here's here's the thing. You still don't let them control your answers. They control the questions they're asking you. You need to know how to answer those questions and defer when you need to. Look, you can you can look at any question that they can put out there about you. And you can redirect that in a heartbeat. What I really want to talk about is, and move on, that's something that's done on both sides, but something I think that if there's going to be a debate between Trump and Biden, Trump's going to have to do every time. Listen, we just want to get back to doing all the great things we were doing when I was president. We want, to, we want the economy back where it was. We want people to have the same kind of buying power or better. We want to secure the border. Make sure your town's not overrun with people who aren't citizens of this country. Uh, we want to do those things that we were trying to do the first time. Otherwise, I yield all my time to my opponent. Right. And every question goes back to that. Listen. We want to bring it everything we can to the table to bring the economy back to where it was when I was president. <clears throat> Fix the border. Making Americans also realize that as a nation, we are secure, not just the borders. But national security is job number one. Look, we just want to keep doing what we were doing the first time. You do that over and over and over again. Biden is going to be lost, and who knows how lost he'll be months and months from now. I suspect there won't be a debate, and Biden will refuse to debate him. 86690-RED-EYE. Brought to you by Hotshot Secret. Hi, I'm Jen Loomis, a transport safety expert at J.J. Keller, and I'm here to share a tip on roadside inspections. Drivers must always be prepared for a roadside inspection. This means drivers should always have their personal, vehicle, and company credentials organized and ready, and having any shipment paperwork, such as bills of lading or hazardous material shipment emergency response information, organized and ready for the inspection official. Just an FYI, the top two violations written against drivers every year, as well as during Operation Road Check, are log general form and manner and log not current. Both are completely avoidable if the driver keeps the log accurate, compliant, and current at all times. Having the vehicle ready for inspection involves the driver conducting daily inspections and making sure any problems that are discovered are immediately corrected. Vehicle readiness also requires the company to make sure that the vehicle is current on all scheduled maintenance and that the maintenance schedule is adequate. This will make sure the driver is being given a sound vehicle to start with. This tip was brought to you by J.J. Keller & Associates. Visit us at jjkeller.com. Lines open for your calls. 866-90-RED-EYE on Red Eye Radio.
It's Friday Radio. He's Eric Carley, and I'm Gary McNamara. Coming up, following the bottom of the hour, we got so much coming up. Uh, latest polling: uh, Biden uh, with independents. Oh, some of the numbers there. His approval rating with independents in one poll. I'll just give you this, and then we'll get to the the the, the full aspect of it. Following the bottom of the hour, twenty seven percent independents. Whoa! Yeah. Also, uh, the uh, L.A. reporter that uh, says. Why DeSantis will win Iowa? <laughs> okay. By the way, when All I just right. laughed like that, I sounded like Jim Brewer. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, well, he might. You know, I guess we'll see. Um, well, I'll, it's I in, it's interesting some of the points that he brings up based on past elections, people that were so far down right at this time. But by the time the Iowa caucus came, gained 20 or 25 points between okay. now yeah. and the caucus. Yeah. Basically saying there's always a possibility because when people get serious, it's a completely different ball game than when you just ask them generically when it gets closer to voting. You know, we saw it. We saw it with um, Trump and, and Hillary where nobody saw it coming until about three weeks before when the internal polls started showing and the Hillary campaign knew they were in trouble beginning three weeks before that election when she most of the time was in a lead. And Trump didn't win Iowa in 2016. Ted no, Cruz did, not. did. Yes. So the question is, does Iowa, do Iowa and New Hampshire give the same momentum that they used to? I don't think you can count anything historically as as a fact these days and, and i think I, I don't think you could a, apply it the same way and and i think the way that this trial is going right now the fraud trial the civil fraud trial we may we mm-hmm. need to make sure we make it's not a criminal fraud trial it's a civil right. fraud trial i think most independents will look at it and go this is bogus oh yeah yeah and, I think so. and so if you don't have the other the other trial the one on the uh the the documents classified documents mm-hmm. they don't believe it's going to happen now until after the election. Yeah. Yeah. Well, may not have an impact. Gary McNamara and Eric Harvey taking your calls. 1 866 90 Red Eye. And he's Eric Harvey and I'm Gary McNamara. Just looking at some interesting poll numbers uh, out there. Uh, Biden's approval among independents, according to a new Gallup survey <laughs> from last week. The survey found Biden's overall job approval at 37%, mm. which Gallup describes as a personal low. Did you see? Tips latest polling over the weekend, mm. 33% approval. Yeah. Uh, most 59% disapprove of the president's job performance. The situation worsens when one examines independence specifically as Biden's job approval numbers have dropped <clears throat> to what the survey describes as a record low. 27% of that group this reflects an eight-point drop in approval over the last month alone. Hmm. To make matters worse, he receives abysmal approval ratings on key issues from independents. For example, just 31% of independents approve of his handling of the situation in Ukraine. 35% approve of his health care policy. This is all independents now. 24% approve of his handling of the economy. 28% approve of his handling of foreign affairs. And 25% approve of his handling of the situation in the Middle East between the Israelis and Palestinians. Hmm. That starts getting you into landslide numbers, you know. Yeah. The approval rating of independence right now, 65% disapprove of Biden, 27%. Uh, approve. Hmm. Those are really bad numbers for independence. Yeah. And those, yeah. 
You know, I, I don't know how they get much lower than that. We'll see. But uh, everything is going in the opposite direction for him. Right well, now. and, you know, <laughs> is it inevitable that the voter is basically going to show up and say, all right, <laughs> anybody else but Trump? If you look at what and, and we bring Michael Rappaport anybody else but it, Trump or anybody else but Biden. Or any, anybody else but Biden. If you're looking at it the way we look at certain, you know, high profile individuals, uh, at least relatively speaking, Michael Rappaport. This is a guy who has been far left his whole life. And when things when the reality started to hit, he was very vocal on social media. And then lately, that was, uh, what, a couple of weeks ago where he came out and just said, look, if it's down to Biden or Trump, I'm voting for Trump. And he's not a Trump. He's a Trump hater, really. It's not a he's not a never Trumper. He's someone who just doesn't like Donald Trump at all. And we asked the question then. How far does that go? How many people are on the left right now? That say, there's no way. I can't vote for Biden. Now, the difference will be, they will tell you, well, it's not just between Biden and Trump. I can vote for Jill Stein. I can vote for somebody else. And that will be interesting to see how many don't vote for either one of them. Or how many Democrats Stay home. I would be concerned. I am concerned as someone who supports the GOP. How many GOP rank and file stay home because of all of the infighting going on with the party? They don't see the party as having a direction. They may not be the strongest uh, Trump based supporter. And then. Voter apathy has a massive impact, which it always does, depending on the level of the extent or the extent of the voter apathy in any given election. I think <laughs> logic would dictate that right now it has a much greater possibility, uh, potential of hurting the left than it does the GOP. But yeah. I can't tell you that for sure. Well, and we, we never know for sure, <clears throat> which is why we don't make specific predictions on elections. Um, but when you look at the one difference in here that didn't exist before is inflation. Mm -hmm. to the From any Democrat candidate over the last 40 years, 43 years, really, this hasn't inflation hasn't been an issue. Mm -hmm. like this. Mm -hmm. And that's the big difference. I think conservatives and independents will be motivated because of that. I I hope that is the case because logically they should be. And they should be motivated by the radicals on the left and everything that else that's going on. And I hope and pray that is the mm -hmm. case. Now the tip poll that was taken uh I just love this to go well Biden's support among Democrats remains relatively strong. You know what it is in this one? Democrats, 66% approve of the job he's doing. Hmm. It's extremely low numbers. Mm -hmm. They go relatively strong. No, it's not. No, it's not. No, I mean, it's it, not. Nor, normally those numbers are up 85 to 90%. Mm -hmm. That's 20 points at least lower. Among Democrats, 66% uh, approve of the job he's doing. In contrast, 86% of Republicans and 64% of independents disapprove. 61% of liberals, people that call themselves liberals, approve of the president. Hmm. Hmm. While only 17% of conservatives, who are these conservatives? Mm -hmm. Well, 70% of conservatives and 31% of moderates express approval. As well, like we said, everybody who promotes themselves as being conservative isn't necessarily conservative in mm -hmm. 2023. Mm -hmm. But they look at it um, here. 
Um, I want to get to the the one point. Oh, we've I guess we've covered all of it because there it is. Liberals sixty one percent approve, twenty five percent disapprove, thirteen percent. I don't know. Uh, moderates fifty six percent disapprove, thirty one percent approve of moderates, thirteen percent. I don't know. But those are really some interesting numbers. Now, what uh, when you look at, I'm going to just get to real clear politics real quick here, looking at some of the polls out there. Uh, the tip poll is just out. Again, that's what we were just talking about. 55% disapprove, 33% approve uh, if you get to the general election. From the Messenger Harris X poll, Trump 52, Biden 48. When adding Kennedy and West, Trump 43. Biden 36. So Trump's lead adding more candidates goes from four to seven points. Trump 43, Biden 36, Kennedy 17, West 4. Wow. Like I said, interesting interesting times ahead. Now, I saw this and I said, okay, let me see how this guy rationalized this. Uh, Victor Jacques from the Los Angeles Review Journal. Um, why DeSantis will win Iowa? Uh, amid all the talk of his impending doom, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis had a great month in Iowa. It's why he's going to win the Iowa caucus. Hmm. That prediction goes against conventional wisdom. The Real Clear Politics polling average has Trump beating DeSantis by almost 50 points. In Iowa, Trump is ahead of DeSantis by almost 30 points plus uh South Carolina governor former South Carolina governor Nikki Haley is surging towards second especially in New Hampshire she's attracted support from major donors including an endorsement uh last Tuesday from Americans for po- Prosperity Action but no one had a better past few weeks in Iowa than DeSantis start with who's left Pence dropped out Scott dropped out. Both of them were polling in single digits, but they were directly competing with DeSantis for religious voters. That's the most important voting block in Iowa. DeSantis now has a better chance of consolidating them. For almost three decades, Iowa governors have not endorsed in the caucus. Current Iowa Governor Kim Reynolds gave DeSantis her full backing in early November. She just won re-election by almost 20 points showing her popularity and political pull. She has been campaigning for him. DeSantis would be smart to do 15 town hall events with her before the caucus. And they talk about other religious endorsements that he has. This is what I find interesting, okay? There has been a major disconnect between Iowa polling and caucus results. Before the 2016 caucus... Trump led Cruz in the last 13 polls in Iowa. It didn't matter. Cruz won. At this point in the 2011 Iowa polling, Santorum was in seventh place with just 3.8%. He owned up when, uh, uh, when, uh, uh, let me see, uh, uh, he ended up winning with nearly 25% of the vote. We're talking about at this time, like right at this date. Right. Uh, and uh, this goes back to 2011 Iowa polling. Santorum was in seventh place, which is 3.8%. A month later, he ended up winning uh, with nearly a quarter of the vote. There's a couple of reasons for that. First, an approaching election causes people to pay more attention. Many end up moving their support to another candidate. Uh, perhaps most importantly, is that the Iowa caucus is a low turnout event. In February of 2016, Iowa had 616,000 active registered Republicans. Turnout for the caucus was around 30% of that total. Around 52,000 caucus for Cruz, which means he won the support with fewer than 9% of active Republicans. A disorganized campaign's polling lead is unlikely to fully translate during the caucus. DeSantis has the best ground game. In fact, he's visited all of the 99 counties in Iowa now. And that's 
which is interesting. Trump has only visited 11. Now, is that because the Trump campaign thinks, hey, we're way ahead, we think we'll win it? Or they also realize, okay, we don't know if we'll win it, but we don't think we'll need Iowa, as in 2016. And that's the whole thing. Uh, at, at National Review, uh, doing an article about this as well, Chuck, they call it going full Chuck Grassley because Chuck Grassley uh, makes it a point to visit every county in the state, you know, in his state. Um, in Iowa, the idea is, you know, get to all of the counties and have and and make it open to the press, which DeSantis has done. And there's the question. Is, again, the Trump campaign looking at it going, OK, we can do a lot with TV and radio. Because you only have, you know, you don't have that long now. You only have a matter of weeks to get all those stops in. It's unlikely he would get to the other, what, 88 counties in the state. Mm-hmm. So that's the question is, all right. We don't have to do it. We can do it on social media. We can do it on TV. We can do it on digital. We can do it with ads. And we don't need, and we don't need to do it because the polls are showing me so far ahead. And if we lose it, no bother. We still know that we're going to win, especially when we get to the South. You know, Super Tuesday is going to be a big deal because Iowa may go to DeSantis. But if the polls in Florida are showing that he's not going to win there March 5th, Super Tuesday. Do you, as a sitting governor, knowing you're not going to win your own state, do you stay in? 866-90-RED-EYE. Get in touch with Red Eye Radio, toll free at 866-90-RED-EYE. It's Red Eye Radio. He is Eric Carley, and I'm Gary McNamara. Coming up following uh, the top of the hour, House is expected to uh, have a uh, vote this week on the electric, the federal electric vehicle mandate. Mm. You wonder if this is the beginning of the rollback or not, how many people will be able to get on board, whether they'll get any Democrats to vote with them uh, uh, on this. You know, we uh, we look at the issues out there. Right now, and you go back to the debate, you and I just having a generalized talk here uh, over the last couple of minutes during the commercial break uh, about the fact that, you know, is Newsom arguing with DeSantis and not being able to have one coherent argument (laughs) on the issues that matter to Americans if he can't do it? Because we haven't had this, Eric. I mean, I don't know in my lifetime where I can look at it and say, yeah. There is no argument if you're a Democrat for the five or six major issues that people care about. They don't have any. Well, you can't watch things that are on fire and say nothing's burning. That's their problem. This is Red Eye Radio on